So yeah, so to introduce our speaker, um, we have Mark Gernis. He's a research scientist with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. His primary responsibilities focus on monitoring wetland conditions in Minnesota, um, largely based on plant communities and water chemistry measures. He and colleagues are actively planning for intensive wetland surveys in Minnesota in 2021 through 2023. In addition, he provides technical input regarding wetlands for several water programs at the MPCA and has been a member of several wetland technical teams. Mark has long had a strong interest in frogs and toads, has participated in frog and toad surveys, and was among the researchers who studied potential causes of widespread malformed frogs throughout Minnesota in the mid to late 1990s. So Mark, on to you. Okay, thank you, Casey. Let's see if we can get the uh, presentation booted up here. So I, I really want to um, thank WPA for the invitation to speak. Um, it's, it's been a while since I've uh, attended one of your meetings or, or uh, spoke to you before. Um, and it's, it's always a privilege to be able to uh, meet with and talk with other folks in the, in the profession. So thanks. And today, so we're going to be talking about frogs and toads. And this is something that I've, as the intro of Kelsey or Casey said, I've, I've had a long interest. I have some uh, experience in, but um, it's not my everyday kind of responsibility. So I had to do a little digging and, and some research. And so hopefully we'll uh, get through this and we'll all learn a little bit or be exposed to something a little bit new. And uh, from there, here we go. So Minnesota has um, 14 frogs and toads. And um, we're, we're fortunate to have that many, though as you go further east or south, it's kind of like if any of you have a background in fish, um, fish surveys, you get a lot richer amphibian community as you move to the south and eastern part of the U.S. Um, and as you move a little further west from us, uh, I think the numbers may start shedding even more until you get to the mountains, at which point then the numbers bump up. But it's a totally different uh, assemblage at that point. So. And so we're going to be talking uh, about those 14 frogs and toad species. Um, I guess people may be used to hearing, you know, frogs and toads and, and always carrying that synonymously. Um, what's the relationship between what's a frog and what's a toad? Are they one and the same or are they different? Um, morphologically, they've they've been broken down into those kind of surnames. It's almost like common names in some respects uh, when you say frogs versus toads, but there are differences. Frogs have a, a smooth skin. Toads tend to have more of a warty skin. Frogs tend to have a silkier or even almost a wet feeling to their, their outer skin, whereas toads are almost always dry. Um, frogs have much longer legs, uh, much better leapers or jumpers. Toads, much shorter legs. They sometimes almost appear to crawl. Um, frogs are a, a more sleek animal versus toads being uh, kind of a little more pudgy or stout. Um, and there are some differences in their um, physiology. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of overwintering habits. Um, for the most part, toads are all um, overwintering in upland areas, whereas frogs uh, do both uh, aquatic overwintering as well as some species are more uh, terrestrial. And um, that all said, the uh, kind of punchline is, or toads rather, are really a, a frog. So we could say Minnesota has 14 frog species and be entirely true in, in that regard. So um, 
So we're going to spend um, a few minutes in this presentation. It probably will go maybe not quite an hour, um, close to that, um, with a brief species overview, uh, which I was just alluding to. And we're going to talk a little bit about threats. These are ongoing threats um, to the frogs um, in Minnesota, amphibians for that matter, including salamanders, um, newts, and so forth, mud puppies. Uh, because they seem to be under a lot of duress these days. And we're going to talk a little bit about monitoring efforts, uh, current and past, and then even touch a few minutes on those malformed frogs from 20 years plus ago. What Whatever became of that? What, what happened to Minnesota's malformed frogs? So um, I think the next slide, uh, we're going to start the kind of inquiry into species by looking at, this is the way I've organized the species, um, by looking at kind of their breeding period. And I think for many of us, the breeding period is probably best recognized because that's when frogs are heard. They are very vocal. And I'm, I'm sure hoping that every one of you have already this spring been hearing frogs, especially some of the warm evenings we've had the last, uh, few days, um, they are calling like crazy. And so I break this just for me, I break it into kind of the early spring. Um, and we have those top four, the wood frog, forest, uh, the chorus frog, the spring peepers, and the northern leopard frogs. They're the early ones. And then that kind of jumps into uh, the pickerel frogs and the toads, which is more of a kind of a mid spring, mid to later spring. And then moving into kind of a later spring, early summer, even midsummer, we get to those species that are singing in, in that time frame. So that's how I have um, organized it. You can see there are a couple of species like the American toad and uh, the tree frogs, the cricket frogs, um, and for that matter, the mink, green, and bullfrog, they have a fairly extensive um, calling season. I guess uh, leopard frogs and spring peepers do as, as well. Um, so next slide. The wood frog. Um, this guy is um, one of our kind of smaller frogs, or at least it might seem that way. They're, they typically will measure um, from an inch up to two and a half inches. As, as a full adult, they have that black band across the eyes, across the face, so somewhat similar to a, a raccoon, if you will. They have a very prominent um, kind of dorsal ridge. You can see in the photo, the one side of it, it their back has kind of, it's, it's divided into three parts, the, the two sides and then the back They're, because of the two, two dorsal ridges. Um, these guys are what are, it has been termed as explosive breeders. They breed very early. Um, I, they probably are already done. I, I heard them about two weeks ago and they sometimes will only vocalize uh, for a matter of days, um, usually in late April to early May, excuse me, late March to early April. And, uh, their call is real similar to, um, I guess, uh, ducks, if you will. And and I don't know, Jack, if the audio is going to work on your end, if we didn't kind of preset that, but if you well, click on that little. Yeah, we'll give uh, it a try. Yeah. I can hear it. Can you I don't hear know it? if everybody else can hear it. There, there's a, a chorus frog in there, but mostly it's that quacky. Those are wood frogs. Um, they actually are, uh, of the 14, the only frog that is frequently found, uh, commonly almost found in our northern peatlands. They can breed and successfully reproduce in very acidic waters down to like a pH of four, four and a half. Um, other frog species just cannot tolerate uh, those, those habitats. They really, really prefer small ephemeral type waters, though they can um, breed in uh, things that are a little bit more semi-permanent, but 
without fish, almost always without any fish. And they overwinter in, in the upland, right, right adjacent, not far from uh, the, the, the breeding pond. Um, so that's the wood frog. Next one will be the uh, boreal, boreal chorus frog or the chorus frogs. You can hear them singing now. Um, they are extremely common. Um, I, I have at times referred to them myself as the, they're the, the weed frog. Um, that's probably not fair to them. They're not real selective in their habitats. They will, they will um, breed, call from road ditches, from semi-permanent wetlands to temporary seasonal wetlands. Um, even grassy swales will have chorus frogs in them. Um, they're fairly small. Uh, they measure only about an inch to maybe an inch and a quarter. Um, they have a, a coloration from kind of a brown, gray, occasionally even to a, almost a green, but it's a light green. Um, they also have those three dorsal, excuse me, two uh, um, dorsal ridges. And they actually have some color morphs. I guess I won't go into that too much, but they like the uh, wood frogs, uh, typically overwinter, very close to the breeding ponds, um, usually under a rock or leaf duff or uh, logs. So these terrestrial overwintering frogs, essentially those that, that do that, they all will lower their body temperature and go into what's called a, a torpor. They, they pretty much, 60% of their body is, is frozen during, during the winter time. And um, they, they are in that state until the temperatures warm in the very early spring. Um, the call, as you can hear, has been described as uh, strumming your finger on a plastic comb. And that can get faster as the temperature rises. Our, our next frog is, again, one of those first four um, that call in the spring, um, spring peeper. And uh, yeah. Maybe you want to just chime up. So it's it, it's different than the chorus frogs. A stronger peep, almost like a single note. Um, a lot of people get the chorus frogs and the spring peepers kind of confused. Um, spring peepers really are more of a woodland species. And the, at one time they were very common in the uh, Twin Cities Metro. They're, they range more in the east central and eastern part of the state uh northern parts they they do range a little further west but um in the twin cities it's getting harder and harder and harder to find um ponds that support the spring peepers uh last one that i remember going to this is a few years ago was up in um Tamarack Nature Center on the north end and i know uh, another really good pond is uh Oh, I forget what the WPA is, but over by uh, Bayport, south of Bayport, uh, if you get back into the woods there, there's a really great um, spring peeper pond there. Um, again, they prefer shallow, very small um, wetlands, ephemeral, typically you know, almost like a vernal pool that are, are wooded. And they also overwinter in the, uh, in the upland. Um, our next frog, is northern leopard frog and i'm listening to the call there as it's it's kind of a low guttural there kind of, kind of a low snore um they are um, kind of an intermediate size frog ranging from uh one and a half to four inches. The coloration can vary from brown to green. And they actually, um, they all have uh, dark splotches. All the northern leopard frog have dark splotches, except on the belly. Um, they have the similar dos dorsal ridges. Um, they overwinter, not upland, but in aquatic settings. So they are, they don't dig into the mud. They essentially are just on the bottom of uh, semi-permanent to permanent wetlands or, or even streams, kind of slowly moving around. Um, 
they have a fairly large, probably the largest home range of the, quote, frogs. Toads, some toads can have a large home range, too. They can move um, almost a mile from their uh, breeding areas, and, and they spend a lot of time in the summer um, foraging in the upland. They're primarily aquatic for, for breeding purposes, so they, they will occasionally return, especially during drying periods, uh, to aquatic habitats, but uh, very much an upland species. Uh, next one is um, the pickerel frog, which looks very similar to the uh, northern leopard frog. Their range is, ex is um, limited to the very southeast part of uh, Minnesota. They're, uh, they're fairly common to the east and south of that range. They are a species of conservation need. Um, and that's, that's based on, um, we'll talk a little bit later, but about the Minnesota Herpetological Society and some of their partners, they've designated the pickerel frog as a species of conservation need because they, they seem to be, um, uh, the population seem to be shrinking. Um, their tadpoles, all the frogs we've talked about thus far, um, are, are single season. So... Um, the tadpoles mature in one year. The pickerel frog have been reported to overwinter their tadpoles on occasion. Um, and they can release a kind of a toxic secretion when handled. Um, they also overwinter in, in the water, though they've also been observed in southeastern Minnesota overwintering in caves that are not aquatic, but um, kind of in some of the crevices. So that's the pickerel frog. Look real similar to the leopard frog, except for they uh, have larger blotches. Next, we go to the toads. Our three toads, Minnesota has three of them. Um, we're gonna start with uh, the most common toad, which is found statewide. That's the American toad. Um, we already talked about the difference between frogs and toads. Um, another difference that I didn't mention, toad eggs are actually laid in a a linear ribbon, whereas frog eggs are laid typically more in a like a, a, a gelatinous globular mass. Um, toads can get to be pretty good size. American toads can range from two on up to almost three and a half inches. Uh, but at metamorphosis, uh, we, we call them those juvenile um, frogs, juvenile toads, we call them metamorphs or uh, toadlets. They are like uh, a centimeter, just over a centimeter in size. So they've got a long way to grow. Um, most of the, the frogs are, are somewhat larger at uh, emergence, metamorphosis emergence. These these guys overwinter in terrestrial uh, habitats, but they, act, they, they will dig. They go deeper, um, maintaining uh, a hibernaculum below frost lines. So they'll keep digging as the frost goes down. Um, the American toads, they, excuse me, hibernate or overwinter singly. So just, just a single um, toad. I should have mentioned their belly is kind of very speckled in, in color. And, and like the, all the other toads, they're very, uh, very warty. Our next toad, um, it's the Canadian toad. There is overlap, obviously, between the, the Canadian toad and the American toad in the western part of the state. The best distinguishing characteristic for the Canadian toad is if you look at that picture on the uh, uh, upper left, that has that kind of real prominent kind of bump. Um, it, it's termed a boss, and it, it's very prominent on the uh, Canadian toad, and it's the best distinguishing characteristic. Um, their belly is also light and colored with speckling, um, and toadlets, again, are small. As adults, the Canadian toad ranges similar to the American toad um, from about two up to three and a half inches. They overwinter socially, so they will congregate into many dozens, and they've they are often associated with Mima mounds, which are kind of a phenomenon, especially in the northwestern prairies of these mounds that can be uh, several feet in, in height and, and diameter. 
They're believed to be or reported to have been constructed or originate from gophers, but Canadian toads um, seek those out and, and will socially hibernate in, in those. Um, they tend to stay a lot closer to the breeding waters, getting maybe only uh, oh, 80 feet or so. That I think that's uh, 25, 30 meters from the, the water's edge where they breed. Whereas the, I didn't mention the American toad is, is a pretty far ranging, probably the furthest ranging frog or toad that we have in Minnesota. And their call, if we wanna just play that, is a real short noted trill. I guess I didn't prompt Jack for the uh, American Toad's call, but that's a similar trill, but it's more continuous um, and, and not as short noted. Um, I guess you want to play it, sure. I, I think the chorus frog comes on every time I play a, a slide. So yeah, well, the chorus that. frogs are so common that they're usually in the background when they provide when they make the recordings. So that, that's partly the other issue. Um, okay. We can keep going. Let, let's jump up to the Great Plains toad. Um, these guys are uh, pretty much restricted to the prairies. Um, their uh, coloration is similar to the other two toads, except for the, their splotching is a little bit more almost linear. Um, and they, they have small uh, scattered warts in each one of those splotches. Um, and the belly is white. Uh, or maybe slightly gray with no speckles. So the other two toads have speckles. The Great Plains toad um, ha do not have speckles on the belly. They overwinter singly in high ground. They are our most efficient and um, aggressive diggers. They are, yeah, they, they will dig deep as needed as particularly in the winter. Uh, again, they maintain um, an area below the frost line. And in the spring, they, they typically emerge from their uh, hibernacula, their overwintering um, burrows, um, in kind of, well, starting maybe about this time in, in April, but even more into late April when, when we have those, those spring thunderstorms that just come through and give a good gully washer and that water gets down into the, their burrows, uh, that kind of re reawakens them and gets them gets them up and going, and they will feed heavily uh, when after emerging because they've been digging all winter to avoid um, frost, and then they'll go to the breeding area. Um, and their call is uh, it's a, little, a little rougher, like a metallic trill. Yeah. So I, all of these these species have have that unique, you know, their own unique call. And we'll talk later about frog and toad surveys, but um, frog calls, it, that's the way to, you know, find what frogs are or wherever. The best way to survey them is by doing, uh, listening to the frogs. Uh, let's go on to the tree frogs. Uh, first one is Cope's gray tree frog. Um, this is, you know, I'm sure we've all probably seen these guys, though they are very, very, very similar to the next tree frog, the great tree frog. So there's Cope's gray and there's the, the great tree frog. Um, both of them have extremely well-developed um, toe pads. So they're great climbers, be it on your, your patio window or a, a trees. Um, their coloration varies from green to gray, depending largely on temperature and habitat. When they're gray, they have a, a kind of a linear speckled sort of modeled pattern to them. Um, and their models do not have a dark border around them. Where the next one we'll talk about they do. Um, they also overwinter on land um, and go into a partially frozen state. Um, these guys oftentimes, well, they, they are typically during the breeding season, not calling 
from the water. All the other frogs we've talked about in toads thus far are in the water. The tree frogs actually call from above the water or at the water's edge. The males are um, up to uh, three feet, about a meter above the water surface. And then when they see females starting to congregate, they'll come, come down. Um, or just at the edge, maybe hang on, hanging on to like a cattail or something like that. But three feet, that's the, the gray tree frog. Um, they tend to favor deeper wetlands compared to say the chorus frogs. Well, the, most of the uh, earlier four frogs, chorus frogs, spring peepers, northern leopard frogs and wood frogs all prefer kind of a, a little shallower ephemeral, whereas the toads, these tree frogs, we're starting to get into more semi-permanent waters usually for their breeding areas. Next is their cousin, the eastern gray tree frog. Oh, before we go, sorry, Jack, I should have, we should do their call. So you can prompt that. There, I'm sure you guys have all heard this out camping somewhere in the, in the early summer. Cope's gray tree frog. And listen carefully, it's a shorter note um, compared to the gray tree frog we're going to hear next. So let's go to the gray tree frog. And you can just start their call right away, Jack. And again, chorus frogs in the background. But you can, you can hear almost mo that more melodious. Not that one, the other. Yeah, more of a melodious, continuous trill. That's the gray tree frog, their call. They typically call from higher up, even 10 feet above the water. So if you're out uh, on a summer evening and you hear a frog, a uh, tree frog calling from up higher, it's the, gonna be the gray tree frog. They are uh, more widely distributed. They're probably the more common of the two tree frogs. Um, though the ranges definitely overlap. Uh, their skin is slightly rougher than the Cope's gray tree frog, um, whose skin is smooth. They both have great uh, toe pads and are good climbers, as I mentioned. Uh, and again, they're overwintering on lock, uh, under logs, rocks, and, and duff. Uh, so now let's go to the Blanchard's cricket frog, and this is kind of an interesting one. It has a, um, a range from the southeastern part of the state, which is, is kind of its understood historic range as well as southwestern Minnesota. They've not been found in southwestern Minnesota for the last several years. So those populations seem to have dwindled. But interestingly, the cricket frog um, has been heard and found in the metro area um, for the last several years. And it, it seems to, the population seemed to be expanding somewhat in, in the metro area, which is, is a little bit curious. Um, they're a small frog and um, I don't know, maybe we should play their call here. Again, the chorus frogs are in the background. Kind of like rubbing your finger on a, a, a comb, but kind of strumming it. They're small. Um, not quite our smallest frog. The smallest frog uh, goes to the uh, spring peepers. But these guys are uh, less than an inch, maybe five eighths of an inch up to about an inch and a half. And the color is generally brown to gray with variable green um, splotches on, on the back. They do have, this picture doesn't show it very well, but a, a brown triangle above the eyes. And, you know, I give these kind of color descriptions. Uh, truth is, you know, I pulled them out of a couple of references. Uh, I, a lot of these frogs I've not seen very frequently at all, unless I'm really going out to do a survey, just, you know, kind of going about my, uh, my wetland work. I, I don't, usually see all these frogs, um, Blanchard's cricket frog, uh, no, you, you hear them. That's the way you, you again, do surveys. 
Um, let's, and they are an endangered species in part due to, we still don't quite have a full understanding of kind of their stability, population stability and, and kind of, you know, the ranges. Um, the mink frog is the next one. And so now we're getting into uh, frogs that are more aquatic. Um, these guys are found more in the northern part of, of the state. They're similar in size to the northern leopard frogs, ranging from about two to two and a half inches. Um, they prefer permanent, deeper water bodies, lakes and ponds, slow moving streams. Color is a base green with brown splotching. And you can see in the photo, um, they, along with the next couple of frogs, are gonna, they have very large tympa tympanum. That's their ear. You can see just below the, the eyes. Um, and when you handle these frogs, they give off a kind of a funky odor. Um, that's their name, mink frog. It's been described by some people as kind of akin to rotten onions. Um, and their hind feet, they're similar to the green frog we're gonna talk about next, but their hind feet are webbed all the way to the end or to the tips of their digits, whereas the green frog only goes part way to the digits. Um, and these tadpoles of the uh, mink frog, they are definitely a, a two-year um, breeding cycle, and they overwinter, you know, in the water. They're, they are an aquatic, though they do go up to, on the upland to forage, um, maybe a, a couple hundred feet. Um, they don't venture too far. Green frog. Um, excuse me. I'm, I might mention that uh, lithobates, if any of you, you probably remember from somewhere back in your your training, um, rana, uh, rana pipians was the uh, scientific name of the northern leopard frog and several of our frog species are in the, had been in the genus rana or, or were ranids. They're still considered to be ranids, but they've been moved into this genus lithobates. Um, and I, so rock something, I'm not quite sure, but I just thought I would point that out. The green frog is similar to the mink frog um, in its kind of base of green with a, a, a brown splotching. Yeah, go ahead and play their, their song. Um, I'm sure you've heard this. Not the chorus frogs. Oh, maybe that one didn't work. Their call has been akin to, um, you know, in lakes, like the uh, the strumming of a banjo with a, a real uh, loose string, kind of. Um, I, that's a poor imitation. But uh, both adults and juveniles overwinter in in the water. Uh, the tadpoles are take two years to mature. They will range, especially when they're younger, um, a few hundred feet from the water's edge. Um, they're probably a little further out than the uh, mink frogs do. Mink frogs are definitely more aquatic. Um, okay, let's go to the next call, or the next uh, frog, which is our last one. Go ahead and play that, if you would, Jack. So that's the bullfrog. The bullfrog is native to Minnesota, but its historic range is believed to have been really from Winona south along the Mississippi River, um, especially in the backwaters. It has been uh, introduced um, in various parts of the state, and I think this map might actually be somewhat old. Um, and people are moving them, which is a little bit unfortunate because they are extremely cannibalistic. They, they feed on a lot of their cousins, the other frogs, and even some small fish. Um, so like any, if you want to call them uh, non-native or invasive species, that might be a little over aggressive label for them, but you know, highly discouraged to be moving these things around because um, they can clearly alter the, uh, the biology of wetland habitats that they get introduced to. The color is largely a, a mottled green with brown. They can measure up to eight inches. So they are definitely our largest frog in the state. They lack a, 
a, a dorsal ridge. They kind of look a little bit humpbacked um, when you see them. They have a very large, this photo doesn't show it, but probably the largest tympanum um, or, or the ear. And that call, we already heard it, but it's kind of that Joe Groom, Joe Groom, Joe Groom. Uh, they are very territorial, extremely territorial, more than more so than our, our other frogs. So other frogs are territorial as well. So that's just a real quick um, run through. And I, I think for a few of these species, we forgot to, or I forgot to prompt Jack, listen to their calls. Jump on DNR's website. Um, they, they have all those calls available there, as well as we'll see in a couple more slides ahead. Um, the um, Minnesota Herpetological Society. Uh, that's actually where I pulled most of the uh, the calls and the photos from. They have a real nice um, site for Minnesota's frog and toads. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to talk a little bit about threats. And I'm sure you've all seen articles, you've all heard frogs seem to be declining. And this decline seems to have gone up, been going on for decades now. And it, it's been linked to several potential causes. And, and I subscribe to the fact that I, I, I believe in probably all of these factors contributing, but primarily habitat loss. Um, I, I think we all know wetlands have been under siege. We probably had seen some backing off on wetland loss, uh, laws like WACA and, and others have, have really had a uh, made an impact on, on our wetland conservation efforts. But even if you have a wetland, I mean, the fact if it's a, a you know, a wooded wetland habitat and it gets developed and yeah, there's, there's a a wetland that they put in so-called, you know, but it's really, it's a pond that maybe they put in in the back of the development. And those ponds, you guys, I think all know, they're very different biologically and um, structurally are, are very different than a natural wetland. So habitat loss is, is clearly a, a significant factor to, to frog populations. I've got a couple of graphics to the right there, right from Minnesota. The one in the center comes from uh, DNR from their most recent publication of Status and Trends. And in blue is the uh, um, time period from, I believe it was 2012 to 2014. It's kind of hard to read. I, I realize it's small. And the orange is from, I believe, 28, so 2028, uh, excuse me, 2008 to 2011. And so you can see across those two that, um, and this is in hectares. Uh, so the, the direct um, gain, that first bar, uh, we are seeing some increases in, in our wetland extent across the state. Um, this is a survey that DNR does. They report out about every three to five years. Um, so a new report should be coming out. Uh, they've got several thousand uh, one square mile plots that DNR flies. So that's the base of this data. Um, it's a statistical survey. Uh, and so the, the point of, of that graphic is to show that it seems like the last couple of cycles um, we are at a point of starting to gain ever so slightly much wetland. We've, we've probably started to reverse the loss, if I could say that. But the reality is a lot of what we are seeing showing up on the landscape as we lose natural wetlands, we're seeing some of these ponds that show up and, and they're not really structurally and habitat wise the same thing. But when you're flying from a plane at 3000 feet up, you, you capture that as an aquatic um, habitat. So that that is you know, part of that story. The, the next graphic to the right is actually from um, our data, PCA. Um, and this is a survey we're gonna actually be doing the next couple of years. And this is 
We have two cycles of it thus far, and it's looking at wetland quality across the state. Hopefully many of you have looked at that report. If not, check it out, it's online, as is DNRs uh, on their website. Um, the green bars, uh, yellow, are, are high quality wetlands. Um, the yellow bars are the kind of fair to good and the red are, are poor quality wetlands. And so you can see uh, across the state, we seem to be from a trend, having a lot more of the you know really good to even excellent quality wetlands. That's largely because of Northern Minnesota. We have a lot of wetlands in the Northern part of the state. Whereas in the Southern and Western parts of the state in the agricultural region, the vast majority of our wetlands are in poor to at best maybe fair condition. Um, so this single graphic is, is a little misleading, but suffice to say the trends thus far are suggesting we're not seeing a great change across those three main uh, kind of condition categories. And of course that comes back to the quality of habitat for frogs and toads. Um, I'm going to skip that last bar to the right. That's essentially just our effort to kind of do it, compare our our sample to what DNR is coming up. So that's again showing a very slight increase. Um, that next row down, disease, the chytrid fungus. Um, it's it's reported in the literature to have probably been around and affecting uh, frogs. Um, for maybe the last 50 years, uh, but really in the last 20 to 30 years, in the last 10 years especially, it's becoming ever more uh, prevalent and problematic. There have been some recent uh, media coverages about the chytrid fungus, and um, it is contributing to extinct extinctions globally. It's interesting that it's believed that these uh, pathogenic forms of chytrid fungus, and I say pathogenic, pathogenic forms because there actually are two fungal species that seem to be contributing to this disease, but they belong to a larger class of fungus that is just very common globally present, but it's these two strains, these two species that seem to be causing the, the parasites the parasitize frogs um, and, and are causing disease in them. Uh, it is acting globally, especially in Central and Southern America, uh, South America. That's what those couple of bar charts, there was an article in Science a couple of years ago that highlighted um, the effect of chytrid that has been widely, widely um, cited so that's a real problem. It is a major problem, no doubt, the second major problem. Uh, that, that photo on the far right of the kind of pink skin, that, that's the fungal infection. The, the frog loses its coloration. It's a very sensitive to the touch. The frogs that have it will even be kind of seen hovering, you know, not wanting to touch their belly to the ground. They are in clear distress. It does all sorts of physiological um, traumas and it does kill them. And it seems to be pretty broad spectrum. Next, um, I'm going to just include malformations and water contaminants. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. Climate change and UV radiation, you know, uh, increase in solar radiation is definitely having an effect on frogs and frog populations, especially some of those in um, higher elevation regions of the world. So not so much in Minnesota, um, though elevate, uh, UV radiation increases here are having an impact as well. And then uh, introduce species, and I would include that with the bullfrog, um, as well as things like carp and cattails, you know, a broad range of introduced species. It's degradation of habitat, um, but I, I put it in as a separate qualifier. So these are having a tremendous effects on uh, our amphibians, on our frogs and toads. USGS on that front, uh, the top banner, estimates that we are losing almost 4% of our, on average, 4% of our frogs every year. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that very long and really hope to sustain populations. 
Um, so that's a quick summary of declining amphibians, a very real issue and something that I've been hearing about and reading about for a long time and it doesn't seem to be going away. Let's jump to the next slide. Malformations. Um, when we were involved in investigating frog malformations, um, and, and the term malformation is or deformed frogs, it, malformation is more appropriate because it, these um, these physical appearances are a result of an inappropriate formation during metamorphosis, typically. And it, it's not, whereas deformities um, suggest something like the lawnmower hit, you know, the blade hit the frog, and so it's now deformed. It's lost part of its limb. That's why we prefer to use the uh, term malformation. And, and these things range, you know, from limbs, lots of limb issues. Um, missing limbs were very common, as we see on that frog to the right. Or the one up to the um, to the left has a missing limb. Um, so the one in the, the upper left has a cutaneous fusion. It's a webbing of the uh, tibia and fibia. Um, those first two segments of the leg. Uh, that's not normal. Uh, there should not be webbing there, and the cutaneous fusion could could occur anywhere uh, from the front to the back limbs. It 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 was not as common as missing limbs, but uh, definitely we saw it. Issues with eyes, eyes missing, missing, eyes being bulged, eyes being likely blind, non-functional. There definitely were frogs that we found with supernumerary or extra limbs. Um, those are some of the more grotesque. Um, frogs that had what we called bony triangles, which the leg bones just uh, were not not formed correctly, or, or there were protrusions that um, stuck out of various places. Um, there was improper development of jaws that we found, poor reabsorption of tails, and and gonad issues. Um, we didn't when we were studying it. We didn't spend um, as much effort on gonads. There have been recent articles, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, that have addressed um, gonadal issues. So that's what we were seeing. Um, why? What was the cause? Um, so we jump to the next slide, Jack. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be pretty brief here, pretty high level. Um, and I would characterize the reported causes, and these are all well documented in literature, into two broad categories, natural and artificial. Uh, I would say that given the historic record of malformations of frogs, they're, they're, I think the earliest written record was from the 1600s, um, kind of an obscure manuscript, manuscript that turned up. Um, so it certainly has been around and been with us, but at very low levels, probably around 1% of the population is what we um, eventually settled on that that's probably the baseline of, of frog malformations. When we were doing the study um, 20 plus years ago, we were finding um, malformation rates uh, not uncommon up to the 20, 30 percent range. So we're even a couple of cases where we were finding almost 90 percent of the frogs that we surveyed at a given location. Um, that was pretty rare, but we did see that. Um, or malformed. And so causes. Parasites, particularly the, the fluke Riberoria, has been um, shown in field and lab settings. Um, frogs have a lot of parasites. They, have, they carry a, because of their aquatic habitat and snails and um, herons and um, Aquatic mammals, uh, mink, muskrats, you know, the like there. There's a lot of exchange of fecal material and snails are frequently intermediate hosts and wetlands have a lot of snails. Frogs are in wetlands. Suffice to say, yeah, frogs have a lot of parasites, um, not, not disputed by anybody, particularly the Riberoria, which are these flukes. 
they tend to the metasecaria, um, uh, which is a mobile state, uh, they burrow into the developing limb bud and can disrupt the um, essentially retinoic acid pathway. So the development from that limb outward uh, usually can, results in um, multiple limbs. That's what uh, parasites are, are have been best identified to be causing. Um, so they can cause and have been shown to cause in the lab other types of malformations. Predation, there's been some really good work, uh, actually in some recent articles even, uh, last five years plus, that have looked at dragonflies um, that, uh, you know, they're very predaceous in their aquatic um, form, their nymphs, nymphs, and they can prey on um, tadpoles, and sometimes that preying can be of an incomplete nature and can similarly disrupt developing tissues during metamorphosis. So no doubt, parasites, predation, they've been around, they are a contributing cause. There is overwhelming evidence that artificial contaminants um, of any number, any range, uh, whether we're talking the biocides, thus herbicides, pesticides, you know, herbicides, um, fungicides, um, insecticides, they have been shown in lab to cause various malformations. Particularly, this is true of the herbicides, atrazine and um, um, glycosate have been two of the most uh, commonly studied. They are known to cause malformations in frogs, um, particularly uh, atrazine, which is a very common herbicide, has been used on corn particularly. Um, and it's, you go sample for atrazine, it's in just about every you know, stream and lake wetland out there. It's, it's the, the most commonly found uh, biocide. And, and studies have shown that atrazine is able to feminize adult frog, male frogs. Uh, so uh, essentially ovaries are found in the testes of male frogs is what it comes down to. They've been exposed to atrazine. So a lot of this is goes back to endocrine disrupting uh, type processes endocrine system, I, I'm not going to go into it, I'm certainly not an expert in that area, but all the way from plastics, certain plastics, to uh, PFAS and uh, uh, PFOA, you know, we're hearing a lot more about these forever chemicals. They have endocrine properties, and uh, there have been some recent articles that have begin, begun looking into potential for uh, PFAS, PFOA to uh, result in malformations of frogs, and uh, there is early evidence that's suggesting that can be the case. So heavy metals and other class of chemicals, all of these in the literature have been shown to be able to cause malformations, including missing limbs. Parasites, there's really some scant evidence for parasites being able to cause some missing limbs similar for really the kinds of pair, uh, missing limbs that we saw um, around the predation. More recently, in the last 10 years particularly, there's been a lot of literature looking at nutrient loading, particularly nitrogen and nitrogen's effect on amphibians, and it appears to be able to um, cause malformations, uh, as does uh, UV radiation, particularly of uh, our spectrum UVB radiation. And then there's that whole synergistic effect. And, and I, to be honest with you, I'm a very strong believer in the interaction and the synergistics uh, as contributing factors. And you know, so there continues to be work. Uh, the PCA, our malformed frog investigations was rather abruptly shut down in 2001. Um, I probably won't go into all the details. Suffice to say, there were decisions made and it was shut down. Uh, largely, it was justified that this was better studied in academic settings and federal agencies. 
And in the, from 2000 to about 2010, there was a lot of rigorous publishing of uh, studying malformation by the academic community as well as some of the federal agencies, particularly uh, USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, but then it kind of shut down. Most of the articles that you see now are from other parts of the world, particularly Central and Southern um, South America. That's where most of the literature is coming from um, in the last several years. And, and they're reporting, they're documenting, they're documenting that there are malformations occurring. People ask me on occasion, you know, do we still have malformations in Minnesota? And, and I would, I typically say, yeah, I expect that we have, but nobody's really looking for them. There is no organized surveys that are going on of malformations in, Min in Minnesota, or for that matter, at this point that I'm aware anywhere in the upper Midwest. So that kind of carries us into monitoring, which is the next set of slides. So we talked about the frog and toad surveys. Um, DNR operated, and I'm not pointing fingers, so we shut our program down in 2001, but DNR, uh, not Game Wildlife, uh, operated a very successful frog and toads calling survey, uh, a lot of support from local uh, nature centers and some cities, um, other groups that um, would go out and listen to frogs and send the data, data to DNR. And so for close to 20 years, uh, 94, to uh, 2017, there was a very active community. Um, and then funding and other priorities came in and um, it was no longer able to be continued. So um, there is not an active non-game wildlife or an active, I guess I would say, uh, frog and toad survey uh, going on in Minnesota, at least that I'm aware of. Um, so next slide. So there's, you know, that, that's one part of the monitoring. The next slide is kind of my efforts to really search and, you know, for this presentation and see who's out there, who's, who's still doing some of this. And there are two areas of Frog Watch, which is fieldscope.org, that top one. Um, this is a national organization that is largely funded by zoos and aquariums, as well as affiliated with the National Geographic Society. They appear to be active and are accepting um, partnerships um, from be it states or whatever organizations, they are accepting data. So if people want to do frog and toad surveys, or if they want to make visual observations of you know, malformations or whatever, when they're in the field, you people, you folks are, you know, you're in the field a lot, as am I. If you see some funky looking frogs, this would be a place to report it. Um, they are accepting data. Peter Johnson, I'm not meaning to highlight him per se. He was one of the more active researchers. Um, he early on uh, was one of the parasite um, researchers. He later did branch out and look at other potential causes of malformations. He is now a professor in Colorado and he had a very active lab that was doing amphibian surveys. I was a little surprised to see that uh, his, his, his page, what he called Malformation Nation, is shutting down in, you know, next week, basically, or actually the, the week after, um, April 16th after that. Uh, I assume funding has, has gone away and another website is, is going away. Uh, USGS, um, their army website. This is active, but it's large. It's not for public observations and, and data. It's largely a composite compendium of their own staff uh, research. And it seems sporadic in terms of what, what's on there uh, across the country from a geographic standpoint in term, as well as timing. I'm not sure how current. Um, some of the articles look pretty old. Uh, you know, more than like five, ten for sure, years for sure. And then the last one, the Amphibian Reptile Survey of Minnesota, which is in partnership with the Herp Mapper. Let's go to the next slide. So Herp Mapper is, it, it's a nonprofit. 
Um, and when I dug into it, it, it's a couple of guys. Actually, there are three people that are kind of at the center of her mapper, two of which are uh, IT type folks that are interested in um, herpetofauna, uh, <clears throat> frogs and toads and snakes, and lizards, you know, the amphibians, reptiles. Um, they are accepting and do maintain uh, data records for reports. They're interested in tracking amphibian decline across the world. They're interested in other types of data such as malformation. They do require, if you are going to upload or submit any data, it must be accompanied by uh, auditory or visual documentation. They need either pictures or recordings. And you know, nowadays everybody's pretty much carrying a, a cell phone. And so it's not unusual that that kind of requirement is, is now required or, you know, that, that that's a part of it. Uh, they are actively accepting records that are uh, you know, vouchered, as I mentioned. And the tie in to Minnesota. So the, there is an organization, the Midwest Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, Herpetofaunal, Herpetofaunal Phenology Project, which is a regional work group of mostly state and federal professionals that they have then partnered with Herp Mapper. So I think there's some money flowing from probably the federal agencies to fund Herp Mapper, but it, it's kind of a, well, I, I don't know for sure. I, I've not submitted any data. This is kind of in the last week or so, uh, exploring the, the internet, trying to get a better handle on monitoring. Um, and Herp Mapper does have a tie in to the Minnesota Herpetological Society, which hosts a great uh, complement of frog and toad uh, slides. Uh, that's where I got all the auditory uh, data from that I, I included in the presentation. And so, and I know Minnesota Herp Society is, um, has been very long active in the state. And uh, some of you may know John Moriarty or Carol Hall. Uh, John is, I think, the regional manager at Three Rivers Park District in, in Natural Resources. And Carol Hall works for DNR as their uh, amphibian reptile uh, survey expert um, as part of Heritage. And they wrote a, um, an update of the uh, Frog and Toads um, book that Moriarty had published with Barney Oldfield in the early 2000s. So uh, Carol and John um, have it's another edition of that publication that came out in uh, 2014. And they are recommending, and DNR's website is recommending um, for any frog and toad survey type data, jump on to um, the Minnesota Herpetological Societies. Um, so they are partnering, partnering with Herp Mapper. So that seems like probably the strongest, best data string going forward. Um, I would say we really do need um, recognizing the worldwide decline of amphibians, recognizing the issues with malformations. We do need to have a stable, in my mind, um, platform for accepting data. And a lot of this kind of data is done by field biologists and citizen scientists. And so, I, you know, I think that's part of the message that I want to uh, uh, put forth in, in the presentation here. So I think there's one more slide, which is just kind of the uh, obligatory, um, you know, thank you for listening to me as well as the frogs. I hope you enjoy uh, strolls in the uh, warm evenings and in the coming weeks and enjoy listening to frogs. Um, there are some great resources online, uh, you know, jump onto them, spend a few minutes kind of hearing those frog calls again, get to know some of the frog calls of our uh, local frog citizens. And that's pretty much it. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mark. We have one question that came up and that is going back to the uh, topic of malformations is, uh, 
is there any research that shows effect by mosquito control on frogs? Excellent question. Um, now, I'm not the expert, but here's what I can say. Um, Mesoprene is one, it's an adulticide that I believe MMCD uses. Um, and, and methoprene, the way that it works is it um, affects the development of the mosquitoes and potentially other invertebrates, midges and so forth. But that's another whole topic. Um, and methoprene has been shown, is known. Um, it, it's not like, it's, it's basic chemistry. It's a very, very, very similar uh, chemical structure and metabolic pathway to retinoic acid. And retinoic acid is what interacting with thyroid hormone is what drives development in frogs, in humans. So that pathway for development, frogs and humans, it is very, almost startlingly similar. And methoprene is is a retinoic mimic. And while we were studying malformed frogs, that was something we did look at was um, the potential for um, methoprene use. It's largely used in the metropolitan area. I think there's some use also up into like the Duluth area, maybe as far west as St. Cloud. I'm not as positive about that. Um, but suffice to say, when we were studying this, we we had reports and we had confirmations of malformations across the state. So there were clearly other parts of the state that would, did not have any potential for methoprene. Other than maybe some, I, I think some pet products might have methoprene in them as well. Anyhow, so that's the best connection I, I have with uh, saying anything about mosquito control. Well, that's interesting. Um... One follow-up question to that that just came in is, do we have a sense for how widespread malformation t is today in Minnesota? Um, that's a great question. And I wish I had an answer based on data. I really wish that. Um, at, you know, at the state level, I, I really think we ought to be looking at our frogs. It's not a priority, it's not recognized as such, so we have not been doing that. Um, I'm not aware of anybody that has been collecting that kind of data. Based on what I'm seeing in the literature from other parts of the world, I firmly believe that malformations are continuing to occur, maybe not at the same rate that they were in the 90s, but I really don't know that because we don't have that data coming in. I think that in the 90s, and I, you know, I'm, I, I don't have my camera on. I'm, I'm not seeing cameras from other folks. Um, I, and I'm not sure the age demographic of uh, participants here. Some of you may have been pretty young, you know, at, at that age or at that time back in the 90s. Some of you I'm sure were around. I, suffice to say, it was a very hot topic and it was in the media and there was a lot of interest from schools and other youth organizations, particularly to go out and survey frogs and probably more so than we probably ever had. And that I do think contributed to the wide range of uh, reports we had. So in other words, we just had a lot more people out there looking so then we found more. Then coming back to the question, uh, yeah, I believe that there are malformations that are continuing to occur. I I suspect it's probably greater than 1%, which might be a background, but nobody's really looking, so we don't know for sure. I can say that... Thank you. Yeah, environmentally, there, there probably it's not been a significant amount of change from the things that people are doing on the landscape. Um, switching uh, topics real quick, going to one of the more peculiar... peculiar things about frogs is um, for the frogs that are mostly frozen in winter, how do they survive? And have you ever stumbled across a frozen frog? Um, I, how do they survive? It's a physiological adaptation that they, you know, from way back when. Um, there was a biologist at the University of Minnesota, Bill Schmid, 
Um, I've read his paper, uh, I think it was published like in 1982, that he studied this for Minnesota um, frogs pretty, pretty carefully. And they are able to essentially suppress their, physio their physiology and they, they, they freeze, go to like a 60% total frozen. You could pound a nail with, with one of these frogs. I've, I've, I've seen them um, only a couple times and yeah, they feel rock hard. And how they are able to unthaw themselves, I mean, it, it, it's spring rains or, you know, warm, warm days in the early spring from the sun that's, that's thawing them out. They're not thawing themselves out. I, you know, beyond that, it's, it's one of the mysteries of nature. <laughs> um, Pretty wild. So you mentioned uh, habitat loss being um, one of the reasons of declining populations. And I was wondering, uh, has there been any interest, because uh, you showed how WACA maybe has preserved wetlands but what about the near shore habitat to wetlands that is technically upland? You mentioned some of the um, browsing distances that some of these species go. And um, if there's turf grass up to the point of wetland, um, what are we losing there? Uh, yeah, really, really good point. That's uh, interface with a, a lot of questions. I could answer that in a variety of, of directions. I, I will suffice to say, WACA, as I think you, you folks know, do, does have some buffer connection to it. We did have the buffer law passed a couple, three years ago now. Um, we require buffers on our mitigation sites that are brought into to WACA. Um, there's little doubt that, you know, mowing all the way down to the edge of the wetland is, is not an ideal habitat, though frogs seem to be there. I mean, I, I remember one study site in particular when we were out doing frog surveys it was mowed to the the edge of a small wetland or small lake whichever you wish to call it and the ground just seemed to be moving from the hundreds th probably thousands of of leopard frogs mostly leopard frogs that were you know moving from the the pond and as you tried to sweep them so they they seem to be pretty successful in foraging there um, so I guess it's, I, I, what I'm trying to say is a mowed, uh, turf down to the edge is not a natural habitat, not something we should be, um, endorsing, but at the same time, I think it can be a foraging area for frogs. Uh, so good buffers is always going to be the better way to go. Yeah. No well, thank you. Um, I, uh, that's all the questions we have. Uh, Casey, do you have some closing comments? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mark. That was a super interesting talk. I, I personally didn't know much about frogs, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, so just kind of remind you guys that please uh, fill out the poll on the field trip if you'd like to provide your input. And uh, also, um, I know we had an email sent out, but this talk that you t just watched um, counts for one credit hour for your continuing education. Other than that, thanks, Mark. Sure. Thanks again for the invitation. Hope I didn't uh, chase too many of you away. Looks like the numbers didn't drop off too much, but thanks, guys.